some folks more towards the beginning of their journey and then as you'll see we in some cases it's an arc of independence and finding your voice and so we thought we'd bring Caroline in to talk a little bit about her independent study project that she did under the guidance of our band director Will Pitts and she's going to talk about uh, a documentary film project that she worked on. Thanks Caroline. Hi, I'm Caroline. I'm a senior, and I'm also an Alpha Omega. So, I'm <laughs> but that means that I remember fourth grade fun dance when my film idea was chosen for one of our films, and I got to direct my first movie. Shall we say? Um, and I never stopped from there. So after Jan term in 11th grade, when I was in the best Jan term ever, music in the movies, <laughs> I got to do an independent study with Mr. Pitts. So it, the independent study for her senior year is an application-based program. So I applied for my independent study, it got approved, and I wrote a 15-page research paper on equine-assisted services. And that's the easy part. <laughs> then I went on to create a 45-minute documentary throughout the first semester of my senior year. And it was combining filmmaking and how equines can help people heal. And then I found three facilities around Atlanta that did equine-assisted services, including one that is five minutes away from Westminster, and many of our students volunteer there. And I interviewed people, and I got B-roll, and I shot for nine hours on end in the middle of the blazing summer. And then I edited it all together and came out with the final project, and then I gave my final presentation. But the independent studies are very student-driven. They're an excellent opportunity to explore whatever you're interested in, whether it be get, what is it, jellyfish galaxies? Like, crazy stuff. Or you can make a movie. And the independent study gave me an opportunity to not only learn so much about what I want to do in the future, but also to learn so much about how to be a person, how to email people, how to cold call people, how to organize schedules, how to get people comfortable answering personal questions in an interview when I had literally just met them two minutes ago and I'm pretty sure they did not know my name. <laughs> but the independent study teaches you how to be a good student, how to be self-driven, self-motivated, and how to come out on the other side feeling so much more confident in all of your abilities. And that all began in elementary school. And those opportunities through the performing arts program, through the robotics team, student clubs, everything that we have on campus for students to explore is what has made my career here so amazing. And I'm incredibly grateful for all of the opportunities for exploration and all of the faculty members who have supported that through my years. And that's why I'll keep coming back to Westminster. I'll play her film and she can go stand to the side of me. <laughs> What's so wonderful about this job is not only being the bright spot of every student's week when they come just to see their, their favorite horse, but I get to see the progress and the amount of stories I've gotten from parents about how uh, they're making strides in their PT that they've never seen before, they're making in their OT um, sessions that they've never seen before. office of the client is the only people working in the arena. And it is, it, there's just things that happen that never would happen in an office. You know, it might take us a long time to get to that office therapy, but 
it happens with the reporters and the, the outcome and the, the, the healing that I see going on with people is very rewarding for me. And it's just, I just need to go and do it. I go to my office in the week. There is nothing so comprehensive as being on a horse because you are utilizing your physical skills, your cognitive skills, your emotional levels to all be working with this amazing majestic animal. the rest of it and hopefully Caroline will show it to us all one day. Um, thank you to our students for joining us for those performances. I hope you guys enjoyed that. I thought that was a pretty fun way to start. Um, but I also wanted to spend some time this morning thanking our parent volunteers. There we go. Um, we truly couldn't function without you. And just since our last coffee on January 30th, we've done all these things and more. Um, we've had our parent volunteers hosted a Best Ever Spirit Night attended by over 300 members of our community. Um, the teacher appreciation chairs treated the Love Hall faculty and staff to a Valentine's breakfast and a coffee cart. Our parents hosted Valentine's Day parties in each of our 26 classrooms. During Christian Emphasis Week, our families baked and donated 125 batches of baked goods for Love Hall, um, Love Hall and Westminster staff, which the children gave to them during a special assembly. Um, let's not forget our family's annual gift of flowers to flower the cross prior to the lower school's Easter assembly. And then finally, during the same period, our parents have also helped with three birthday celebrations and have continued to create the beautiful bulletin boards outside the front office that we've enjoyed all year. In addition to these on-stage volunteers, today's the day I'd also like to thank those who worked backstage to make the, the pause in lower school magic happen. Our pause in lower school executive committee, many of whom are in the audience today, um, have supported and steered our chairs and their committees to fund, send communications about, and execute their events and service projects and affinity group gatherings. Exact none of this would have been possible without you, so thank you. I'd also like to thank our 26 room representatives, the other behind the scenes um, folks who keep our parents informed. They helped usher in our school year and keep things running throughout the year. You guys are instrumental in making our new families feel welcome and you're also instrumental in helping us send the kids off at the end of the year with great fun and celebrations in that last week of school. We're also looking forward to announcing next year's Parents Council slate. That'll be coming soon. But as May approaches, we still need more volunteers for room representatives. So that if you're interested in getting more involved, that's a great way to get started. Look out for a post in the WPU, as well as an email from your room rep with the nomination form for room representatives for next year. All right, um, now I would like to invite Lower School Director of Student Life, Becky McKnight, to join me up here. This is the part I have to read so that I don't cry. Um, <laughs> um, Becky will be retiring this year after serving, oh, this might be news, uh, after serving 27 years on the faculty at Love Hall. But she's been a member of the Love Hall community even longer. Her oldest child, Cameron, started at Westminster in 1994. I'm sure I speak for everybody in this room, Becky, when I tell you that we don't know what we're going to do without you. The wisdom and knowledge you shared, excuse me, uh, with our children as an educator and with us, our parents, has been truly shaping the lower school experience for generations of Wildcats. So, as a very small part of how we're going to honor your dedication to Love Hall, um, we have purchased a series of books for the library called Tales That Tell the Truth. So this is Becky's series. Um, and these books are, um, they are chosen with love by our expert librarians, but they're beautifully illustrated story books that use Bible stories to encourage children to learn and grow in God's word, as you have done for all of them, through your words and then more importantly, your actions. 
Um, well, one copy of each book will stay here in the library. We have one for you to take home. Um, this one is called The Big Wide Welcome, and it's all about how Jesus' church um, extends love to all people. So, um, welcome to everyone. Um, so, thank you. Thank you. I hope that today is just one celebration um, of many before the end of the year. to the arts, visual, performing, and literary, and have several uh, musicians and authors in my family. I've enjoyed serving our talented band, orchestra, chorus, and art teachers this year who inspire our children every day to express and to challenge themselves through art. This year, students in the visual arts had a show at the High Museum. Band and orchestra students perform solo and ensemble concerts, chorus students perform concerts and are preparing a musical, and students wrote songs, stories, and documentaries. 
it is an incredible gift for our children to have these opportunities. <clears throat> in thinking about the devotion today, I was drawn to a quote from Rabbi Jonathan Sachs, an international religious leader and scholar. Sachs wrote of the arts, quote, art in Judaism always has a spiritual purpose to make us aware of the universe as a work of art, testifying to the supreme artist, God himself. To me, this has three inspirational meanings, which I would like to share today. First, art invokes and nurtures our spirituality. It does this by pointing to something beyond itself. When we experience art, we are part of something bigger than ourselves. Sometimes this is literally true when we play in an orchestra or band or sing in a chorus or work with others on a film. But it is also true that any form of art causes us to examine our own meanings and connections. I was once surprised to hear an author say, when asked about the meaning of her latest book, that people were still determining its meaning. At first, I found this to be an odd answer. How could she not know what her book means? But on reflection, I found it a profound recognition of the role of art. The artist provides the medium through which we understand and situate ourselves within a larger purpose. Rabbi Abraham uh, Ho Cohen Cook once described art nurturing his spirituality and purpose this way. Quote, when I lived in London, I would visit the National Gallery, and the paintings that I loved the most are those of Rembrandt. When I first saw Rembrandt's paintings, they reminded me about the creation of light. When God created the light on the first day, it was so strong and luminous that it was possible to see from one end of the world to the other. And God feared that the wicked would make use of it. What did he do? He secreted it for the righteous in the world to come. But from time to time, there are great men whom God shares and blesses with a vision of the hidden light. I believe Rembrandt was one of them. Hearing Westminster students perform vocally and with instruments the great works of religious leaders and composers during the Easter and Thanksgiving services and the Christmas pageant may have the same effect on some of us. During that time, perhaps we see the light that Rabbi Cook spoke of and connect in community with our spirituality. Second, art helps us experience and create beauty I'm sure we've all experienced certain songs or images, perhaps paintings from a certain era or the architecture of a particular place, lifting our spirits. Maimonides, one of the most significant Jewish scholars of the Middle Ages, said, for example, quote, if one is afflicted with melancholy, he should cure it by listening to the songs and various kinds of melodies, by walking in the gardens and fine buildings, by sitting before beautiful forms, and by things like this, which delight the soul, and make the disturbance of melancholy disappear from it. I am not sure that he would think the 1980s music I listened to uh, fits this uh, bill, but certainly it has this effect on me. There is an undeniable instrumental value to art. But art has an intrinsic value as well. Art reminds us of the beauty in our lives and helps us see the good in ourselves and in others. This has resonance during the difficult social times we currently face, with increasing armed conflicts around the world, human-caused environmental harms, and political polarization. Art is a higher form that has the power to transcend these differences and to build consensus and community. This power has been historically recognized by financial support for the arts, from the New Deal to the proposed bipartisan Creative Economic Revitalization Act, modeled after it, in recognition that, quote, the arts, no less than business, agriculture, and labor, are and should be the immediate concern of the ideal commonwealth. And at a yet even deeper level, art can help us see the beauty of holiness. This concept in Judaism is called Hadrat Kodesh, as Psalm 29.2 states, quote, give, the God, give to the Lord the glory due to his name. Worship the Lord in the beauty of holiness. Art is a route to connect to God because art mean, is a means to create beauty. This holds true for every child 
who endeavors to write, design, sing, or play an instrument. Third, art raises our awareness of the world around us and our role in shaping our communities, both immediate and global. Art provides us a way to explore and to understand the world. Art is an expression of humanity, and it does not end there. <clears throat> The Kehinde Wiley Project in fourth grade art this year exemplified this for me when children were asked, quote, who deserves to be on the great museum walls? I interpreted this to mean, what do we do, what do we want to reflect about our humanity? The students wrote about diverse representation and were able to appreciate their own identity and worth. When asked how they felt about the project, students replied, brave, strong, important, and beautiful. This was an empowering exercise that can easily translate into awareness about the world and how each person can contribute to better shaping our immediate and even global communities. With these ideas of spirituality, beauty, and awareness through art and mind, I would like to end with the Shehekienu prayer, which is the Jewish blessing of gratitude for a new or special occasion, as this, I believe, is the first coffee and conversation about the arts. Baruch atadonoi Eloheinu melech haolam Shehekianu v'kiyamanu v'higlianu lazman hazea. Blessed are you, Adonai our God, sovereign of all, who has kept us alive, sustained us, and brought us to the season. <coughs> Amen. Thank you. Um, I'd like to welcome Keith Evans to the stage to give us the Westminster update. Well, good morning. Good morning. Good morning. This is a uh, meeting with a lot of milestones in it. One is Windsor's final meeting. Thank you, Windsor, for your leadership. <laughs> Becky's announced retirement. Congratulations, Becky. We have more glory to heap upon you before the year is over. But thank you for everything you've met. And importantly, I think it's the last meeting we're going to have in this room. <laughs> So, so this is really exciting for me because I like to build things and I like to have spaces that actually, you know, sort of work for the audience and that kind of thing. And I want, I want just because we're kind of in the darkness before the dawn moment of construction, which I'm going to show you some pictures of here in a second. I just want you to, to do a 360 about where we are, create a mental snapshot, and then when we have our first meeting in the fall, I want you to do a 360 of where we will be and kind of compare those snapshots. So let me give you kind of uh, just a little bit of an overview around construction. Then I want to show you some pictures from inside the construction uh, because we're in a sort of interesting phase of it right now, uh, or at least interesting to people like me. So this is where we started. Uh, this is our site. This was once uh, the softball field. As you may, may recall, there was a uh, softball field there and some, uh, some other things that we we used and we, we began to uh, prepare the site and get it ready and as we look at it today it's quite different we're under roof and we actually can go in the building and stay dry and uh, actually have done an event or two inside the building just to, to show it off ahead of time but this is quite a uh, quite a change and one of the things that uh, I want you to notice about this picture in particular which you're going to notice once you're inside this uh, new addition is how Love Hall is sort of migrating toward the rest of the school. This is very much a part of the master plan that we hatched uh, several years ago. That we would begin to try to connect our campus uh, rather than separate divisions and separate departments and separate <coughs> activities. We'd work toward integrating them, and suddenly this part of Love Hall is just right on the middle school. It's just looking right on the middle school. And you actually, I'll show you a picture in a second, but when you look out the window of this auditorium, 
you really get a sense of just how close you are uh, to, to uh, Presley and the quad and so forth. The other thing that uh, you can see up in the very top right corner is you can see that old green gym. <laughs> got a twinkle in my eye about that old green gym. Someday we may not have that. But you are actually, uh, you're actually migrating toward Barge also. So many of you all have been in uh, Love Hall activities that have taken place in Barge. And the idea is that uh, the lower school continues to kind of grow in that direction as well. And again, the campus begins to uh, become more integrated. This is another shot just to give you kind of another, another look, another sense of, of how this is situated. The, this auditorium, which is this, uh, this large block right here uh, in the center, has a view out toward uh, the rest of Love Hall and a view toward the rest of the campus. And so this is not uh, intended to be kind of a black box theater. It's intended to be kind of an open, light-filled space that serves a lot of different purposes for us in addition to uh, meetings perhaps like this one has a large open floor that will allow for uh, something like an innovation fair, uh, any number of different kinds of performances. But those are happening uh, with a great deal of natural light and a view out toward the rest of the school uh, as, as they're uh, unfolding. And then the, uh, to the left of this, in that uh, uh, back part of the building, are where the innovation labs and the things that will be moving out of this building into that building uh, reside. Now we go inside, and this shot, you're standing with your back to the seating in that auditorium, and you're looking out that window that heads toward the middle school and then beyond the middle school, and you can kind of get a sense of suddenly sitting in this new auditorium and feeling like you're a part of the rest of the school. This is, uh, this is no accident for young kids, right? We want them to kind of see where they're headed, see kind of what's ahead while they're not necessarily sitting in class with 13 or 18 year olds, they, uh, they have a vision here for uh, what lies ahead of the campus that's out in front of them. This will seat uh, about 400 or so people in seats and then this floor that you see here uh, can also be set up with chairs as well. Or the floor can remain open for uh, you know, a performance or uh, an exhibit or something like that. Now this is where we get to the darkness before the dawn pictures. Uh, when the site is empty, and when the steel is going up, it's quite exciting. And when the walls go up, but before the interiors are finished, folks who, who follow this closely or in the building a lot are always like, this will never be finished. <laughs> but I will tell you, from this moment to a finished building is just like a blink of an eye. It is just amazing. The work of the building, the hardest parts are really finished at this point. The, the foundations have been laid, the walls, the structural pieces of the walls have been put up, all the windows have been snapped into place, and what actually remains is really just finishing. And it, and it looks like a lot of work, but it actually happens really, really fast, because largely from this point to the conclusion, there's a lot of sheetrock, ceilings, those kinds of things. And so, uh, so the dawn really is quite close at this moment, even though it doesn't necessarily look like it. But you get a sense here of, again, looking out some of the windows and different things that uh, you can see from the inside and the interiors. Uh, again, a photo like this, and no doubt you say, how could this be ready in the fall? Uh, I look at a photo like this and say, we are right on the cusp of being ready. We are almost there. Um, and so it still very much looks like a construction site, but it's really just finishing the, uh, and, the, and the interiors that have to come into play here. And then as you go out the back, uh, this back area will be a large flat green play space, something we haven't had at Love Hall before. And so what was once the softball field and then connecting to uh, large commons will, uh, will be that green space and a pedestrian path where it'll take you there. And then finally, uh, this part in the back is where those innovation labs have those large sliding doors that will open up and allow students to flow out into the indoors and the outdoors connecting the interiors of the building to the outdoors. So that's the new construction. Uh, that's where we'll be next time we gather here for this, uh, this group. Again, want you to kind of snapshot the space you're in for another reason, because this is just phase one of this project. As soon as uh, our kids are back in your care permanently for the summer, 
uh, and really practically as the last one is leaving, we come into all of these spaces to renovate. So this has gotten a great deal of attention because it's quite visible, but actually these interior spaces uh, get, a, get a complete renovation as well. And so if you imagine sort of drawing a line at the edge of Hamilton over here where the kitchen is, across this hallway to the edge of the library, and all the space going this way, all of it gets a complete renovation. So this long green hallway, the loneliest walk in Atlanta, <laughs> for any first grader, walking down the hallway saying, will I ever see a friendly face? Will someone smile at me? Will eventually be wide open, and Lauren Dupree's office will be out in front, and kids will be greeted as they come into the building, and when, they, when, when your children or when uh, any of us walk in, uh, the common, the library will be kind of opened up into more of a commons area. Uh, there will be visibility into all the things happening in the school. Uh, this space and the stage will all be renovated. All of these uh, practice rooms, or I'm sorry, the art studios over here will turn into instrumental music uh, spaces as well. And so uh, what we're hoping is that when you come in here at some point uh, to deliver your kids or to visit a class or to volunteer, whatever, you walk in and all of it feels new. So it's not just the new construction, but all of this. And uh, that is a little bit also of why uh, the lower school is going to start just a couple days after the middle and upper to give our faculty a chance to move in and, and uh, what we affectionately refer to as burn in the spaces, right? To actually be here and be ready and have everything uh, moved in and ready to go. So this is really... Uh, it's really an exciting moment because uh, while it doesn't necessarily look like it, this is really past the, the cusp of being finished. And uh, what'll, what will happen now is it will move very quickly from this point. will begin to look like real usable interior spaces. And we're really, really excited about all that uh, it's going to mean. It is going to, to, I think, really transform the experience of our students to have spaces that actually fit the programs and activities that uh, that have grown up in Love Hall and spread out across the entire campus. The other thing that I want you all as lower school parents to just be aware of is that as, uh, as this interior is going through some demo and, uh, and renovation, we'll also be uh, starting a project over on the upper school quad, taking the Scott Hall site, which is right directly across from Cressley, and uh, this summer is gonna be demolition summer. We're gonna do the demo inside here, and take that building out as well, and then there's an 18-month construction project that's right at the heart of the campus. Uh, you all are uh, extraordinarily fortunate that you aren't going to have to live through that from the upper school side because it's you know, a lot of fencing. It's going to be kind of a construction site where we're offering classes, uh, and so we're, we're bracing everyone for that. But it'll be ready for your kids when they get there, and uh, we'll still smell like fresh paint. So, so that's what's happening. Stay tuned. Remember this moment. You won't experience it again, I promise. It will be better next time. We'll be in, uh, in some new spaces with some really great natural light, and uh, I think we'll really find it's uh, an exciting set of projects. Thank you. Again, hand back to you. Thank you. Thank you. So good to see all of you. Thank you for coming out on this really nasty, rainy day to join us and to have this conversation about the arts, not only in the lower school, but across campus. Um, I did want to take a moment just before we continue to thank Windsor for being such an incredible thought partner um, and just guide through all of this. When she stepped into this role, she inherited me, a very new head of lower school, and she did not flinch. Um, she actually em embraced this opportunity eagerly, and despite what time of day I sent her a text message or how long our monthly meetings ran, anytime I said, how might we, or what do you think about, or leading with a, so this just happened, um, <laughs> Windsor was great, and she's just been such an incredible partner and advocate for our parents, a good touch point for us to have an idea of what parents are thinking and how they're feeling, and just, I cannot thank you enough for your partnership this year. So let's give Windsor a round of applause.
also, it's a very exciting time of year as we are living in this school year, thinking about how we are going to finish strong. We don't have a countdown. Go Some of us might have a countdown. <laughs> I don't have a countdown going on. Um, but we also are living in how are we going to make the most out of next year, and we're dreaming big, and that's the part that we're living in right now. Keith mentioned that we there's a little bit going on this summer in Love Hall, um, and so I did just want to point out a couple of dates for you just to reiterate that this will be the first time that we're not in sync with middle school and upper school, so just drawing your attention to our start date, but especially that August 20th date, that Welcome Back Wildcats, we have a lot that we want to welcome you back to and show the kids. And so we're already dreaming big. How are we going to get the kids into all of the spaces? How are we going to create an activity for them at each space so that they are really engaged and learning their way around? The building is going to look very new to them. We're really excited, but we want them to come back and feel like it still feels like home, their home away from home, and we want them to feel celebrated and excited about the year to come. So certainly more information coming about that Welcome Back event, but it, you do not want to miss it, so make sure it's on your calendar, and then we'll be ready to greet students officially on the 21st, which will be our first day of school. I also just wanted to talk through a couple of changes for next year that we're really excited about. Um, I'm gonna let, I can see you guys, you all went up, so it's fine, I get it. I'm gonna give you a second to read, and then just talk through some of these changes. So we have a great problem in that we all want more time with your children. So one of the things that we are doing is we are going back to a carpool time. It's like before COVID, um, if you can even remember BC, um, where a carpool was actually a, a really short period of time in the morning. And so we're returning to that. So carpool will run from 7.30 to 7.55, which will allow us to begin morning meeting at eight o'clock. We'll still begin each day with morning meeting, having that important time to greet each child um, to begin our day, but that allows us to, to have more time each day with students. So that will be a change. Another change is pre-first. Um, we'll actually dismiss at 2.30 next year along with our first grade students. So again, we just want more time with your kids. Something that is really exciting for us is we are shifting back to a Monday through Friday schedule. I have always appreciated, and I know I've actually spoken about this at previous pause meetings, I've always appreciated how Westminster is willing to take a look at the students we have, um, take a look at what the needs are at any given time, and say, do we need to make any changes? We are, we are quick and eager to reflect, reassess, and make changes based on what we need. A, years ago, we recognized that we needed this time in the homeroom where we offer so many amazing specials, but we noticed that literacy and math instruction was like 20 minutes here, then they pack up and they go to art, and then we've got art class and they come back and we have maybe 35 minutes of math class and then we're transitioning to the next special. And what we want to do now um, is we've taken a look at our specials and come up with a, a rotating schedule to make sure that we have some regularity in the homeroom. Because what we need to help our children with, what we recognize now, is that routine. We need to make sure that they know what to expect, they know what's coming next, and so they can start to develop their executive functioning skills. And the rotating schedule the A through G and the Monday through Friday and what what is it and it's a special day because it's a Friday so now this special actually comes now it's really unsettling and it creates a lot of actual extra transitions in the school day so along that theme of wanting more time with kids we have restructured the schedule for next year so we will be on a Monday through Friday schedule so a Monday schedule will actually be a Monday in the, in the real world um, Kids will have some predictability when they need to bring PE clothes, when to bring their instrument. They will know what to expect, and we're able to provide that, that comfort and that routine for kids. So we're really excited about that change. 
The last change that I just wanted to mention to you is we are getting on board with what the middle school and the upper school do with the semester model. We have been in a trimester model for years, um, but we're making that switch and we're excited about this because we feel like it's going to offer parents more regular communication with parents. So in making this shift, instead of right now, our first parent-teacher conference doesn't happen until November, this will actually shift up. So we will have a beginning of the year hopes and dreams conference in September. We'll have a, a touch point in October, a regular parent-teacher conference. A progress report will go home in December and then we'll replicate that in the second semester. So there'll be another conference in March and another progress report in, in May. So you'll be actually hearing about your child's progress more uh, routinely throughout the year as opposed to just at the end of each trimester. So we're really excited about this change as well. Um, with that, I want to introduce our featured speech speaker and just know that this will be coming out in email as well. So if you didn't take a picture or you have questions, we'll have more opportunity to discuss. Um, but what a treat it is for us to hear from Adam Copeland today, Westminster's Director of Performing Arts. Although this is only Adam's second year as Director of Performing Arts at Westminster, his roots at the school run deep. He graduated from Westminster in 1991. While a student at the school, Adam performed in a dozen plays and found his home on stage. Adam is also a Westminster parent with his daughter Cassie in sixth grade and his daughter Nina in 10th grade. Professionally speaking, Adam has worked in live theater for nearly 30 years. Notably, Adam founded and served as the artistic director for the Flying Carpet Theater Company from 2002 to 2022. There, he oversaw the creation of 14 work premieres from incubation to full production. In parallel with his work in theater, Adam has been involved in arts education since 1998. He spent many years in New York as a drama teacher, arts coordinator, and teaching assistant at schools and organizations in the greater New York City area, both professionally and philanthropically. In his free time, Adam is a screenwriter and a proud member of the Writers Guild of America. He also recently served a two-year term as board chair for the William Bremen Jewish Heritage Museum here in Atlanta. We're lucky to have Adam and his passion for making arts and culture available and accessible for our students here at Westminster. Adam, I'd like to take it away. Hello and welcome, thank you all. So I'm gonna run through an agenda so you get a sense of what I'm gonna talk about today. Um, I'm going to start with a personal story of uh, some of my time here at Westminster and before. Uh, we're gonna walk through Westminster's guiding philosophy of the arts here. So you get a sense of how we think about your, uh, the, the journeys of your student. We're going to, I'm going to define terms, because I'll be throwing some jargonese at you, and I want everybody sort of on the same page as we go through and talk about the arts programs here. I'm going to, because I'm aware that some of you may not necessarily have the full vision of the depth and breadth of the programs here, we're going to go through some of just nuts and bolts, what we actually do here at Westminster, what we don't do here, and how it works. And then um, we're, we're going to talk about those opportunities by division because there are some slight differences in how we think about arts division by division. <coughs> and then um, I'm going to walk you through some programmatic changes on our horizon. And finally, we'll end with some areas for big growth that we see in the next couple of years. So. Uh, <laughs> that is me on the McCain stage in the 80s. I was playing Huckleberry Finn in our production of Tom Sawyer, and I think it was one of the most electrifying and meaningful performances of the latter half of the 20th century. And uh, if you don't believe that, you could certainly call up my mom who would go on and on about that. <laughs> Um, but before that, I want to talk a little bit about lower school arts. 
So here's me in first grade. You can see I was a bit of a ham. And uh, I had a powerful experience in the arts and in theater in first grade. I, we, we did a play of Bible stories at my elementary school, and I got the plum role of Noah. So I was psyched because I was pretty sure, you know, I was kind of into tools, and I was psyched that there was going to be like wood on stage, and I would be kind of putting together the ark. And our teacher said, no, 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 you're just going to have to mime it. And I didn't know what mime was. So I learned that the teacher taught me in first grade a little bit about mime and pantomime. Okay, so, and, and then I'm up on stage that's a full auditorium, and um, I'm doing my mime of building the ark. And it was dead silent in the house. And I thought, this is not right. Like, I've got to do something to electrify this crowd. And I, I, improvised and I had this moment and I, I don't know where this inspiration came from but I pretended as I was miming my hammer that I'd smacked my thumb and then it really hurt and I shook it out and the crowd went wild and I think that um, gave me a taste for live theater improvisation and a, a, a little fun fact is that a, a person a classmate of mine came up later that day and said, that was really funny, that thing you did with your thumb. And that, that person ended up coming with me to Westminster. I had dinner with them the night before last. So to some degree, I'm also painting a picture of the kinds of community that gets built when we do art and we make theater. So I want you to hold on to a couple of elements of that story as we go, because it, it goes into our guiding philosophies of how we do art here at Westminster. So. I got a little acronym, JAM, all right? The first thing I want to lead with is the arts here, we are very serious about this being a place filled with joy. Oh, saved by the bell. No, that's a good reminder for everybody to do um, So we have um, a creative community that that forms when we are surrounded by this joyful act of making art together. And the, you know, the jargon that some of the arts folks who write about this work use is that it's a place to find your tribe. And we've actually seen that to be true over time, that kids naturally gravitate. The, the arts classes end up being a place with kids who just naturally end up being friends. And so this sense of a joyful, creative community where people are comfortable, they have fun, I'm gonna lead with that and say for us, that is the most important thing about doing the arts at Westminster. This sense of bringing people together around creativity and joy. We are also very serious about moving artistic skills along. So my second part of this acronym is artistic skill development. Year over year, class over class, yes, they're joyful places, but they are joyful in the context, whether it's music, whether it's drama, whether it is filmmaking, we are making sure that in every class, your kids are getting concrete skills, they are getting better at the art that they are working on. Finally, I'll say that a way we think about the arts here is, I'm going to use the phrase, mindset acquisition. The arts are an incredible place within the context of education where we have a unique opportunity to not just make art, but to also train young people in certain mindsets or habits of mind that make them better people, better citizens, and better leaders. And I'll tell you a little bit about that as we go. So, Joy and Tribe, I'm going to read a quote of one of my arts education heroes, Sir Ken Robinson. He was the uh, first head of Paul McCartney's school when Paul McCartney founded a music school. Never underestimate the vital importance of finding early in the work that, finding early in life, the work that for you is play. So we, we, we set up these environments where the kids absolutely have their same wildcat work ethic, but it's fun, they, they, they just want to do it. And so that's, that's this joy and tribe piece. And across 
across campus and across K through 12, that, that value is rock center. Mindset acquisition, I'm just gonna bring this up quickly. These are things in, in our field that have become more and more front and center. When we teach the arts, we use it as an opportunity to, in that first list, think of a visual arts teacher. When that kid gets the blank page or the clump of clay, a skill that they have to use is to envision what they're going to make. And that idea of building something out of, of from the blank paper is gonna be true regardless of what field that they ultimately go into. The skill of envisioning something is a life skill. And so what I'm getting at is that we also, in addition to the technical skills of making that sculpture or painting that painting, we're also looking at these life skills through the arts. And visual arts has one set of life skills that they're especially good at working on. Music has another, drama has another. In each, in each genre, we take that mindset acquisition very seriously. And then, of course, art skill development. We, before graduation, one of the things we're going for is year over year, we're looking for growth and progress. Each teacher would have metrics to tell you and explain what that looked like, but you are seeing the young people incrementally get better, and then at a couple of these inflection points exponentially get better. We, you know, while most of us are in the arts for the sort of poetry and the soul of it, I will not lie, we are also Westminster and we can get a little bit competitive at times. And uh, when we do, we're good at it. We win, uh, we have a huge number of kids that compete in state level orchestras and they do very well. Um, after graduation, some of our students do go on and make professional careers of the arts. And when they do, um, that, I mean, that the fact of making a living in the arts, we are proud of. And then some of them are at, at actually at the absolute highest levels. We have Tony, Emmy, Grammy winners coming from Westminster. We hear again and again, but, and I want to emphasize as proud as I am of our professional artists, I am the most proud that we hear that no matter where you go in life, you're taking some of the things from our arts programs and feeding it into your the way that you're a citizen, the way that you're a leader, the way what you bring to your professional portfolio. And we hear that, you know, I, I some of my sense of community and how to work with other people came from being in the band. It's just, you know, when people come back, that's what they talk about to us. So now let's define some of the terms that uh, I'm going to use when we talk about our arts programs here at Westminster. So we've got curricular versus extracurricular versus arts integration. Unlike many schools around the country, Westminster is so committed to the arts that there is not a year where your students will not have the opportunity for a full year-long, day-by-day, professionally taught course with arts instructors. Just have a moment to ponder that because there are so many places across this country where that would be an unbelievable luxury. It is not common. Westminster is so committed to the arts that we have professionalized instruction in the arts every year, and a lot of it, and it's done incredibly well. So that is what I'm calling curricular. You're, for one hour a day, you're in a music class, you're in an art class. Extracurricular, self-explanatory, but the way it works here, we're gonna kind of get into about the most of the extracurricular opportunities happen a little later in your, your young person's uh, art. Then finally, arts integration. What I mean when I say arts integration is that we think about bringing artistic projects into the classroom in, to help teach other core subjects. A filmmaking project in an English class, a drama project in a history class. These are ways to leverage creative energy to get at other core content. 
So arts integration, when I use that phrase, is especially here in love, opportunities for kids to make art in the, in the context of their classroom. So um, also, I'm gonna just as a side note say that I am the director of performing arts here. As we go and there's q and I can answer some things about visual arts. I'm speaking predominantly about performing arts now, but we can definitely talk a little bit about visual arts. Both programs are very robust. Performing arts we do at Westminster. So we, and it's somewhat in our DNA, as, as you heard before, I was in the drama program. The drama program predated me by, it was at the origin of the school in the 1950s. Most of the arts that we do here are baked into the DNA of Westminster and have been here since about the beginning. And there are four that have are, are uh, very mature programs, orchestra, drama, band, and vocal and choral music. So uh, long histories, storied histories in those. We are also at the moment, and you'll hear more about this as I go, building out where we think the future is headed, uh, film and media studies. So as we continue to sail forward, we're not retreating by any stretch in our core four, and we're building out more in this uh, digital storytelling realm. So we're also making sure we're all speaking the same language here. There's some stuff we don't do. Um, we went to FESCON this year. There's a huge movement across Georgia of these schools that are doing Cirque. You know, they've got tumbling and they've got trapeze in their school. It, 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 we, we don't do it. Um, <laughs> right, what can I tell you? Um, in New York, where I came from, one of the huge departments at the art centers that I worked at was performance poetry. People would write slam poetry, they'd compete. We don't do it here. It's, it's a great genre, it's just not something we do. The marching arts, we have an incredible band program, but if you're thinking we'll be doing marching band or drum corps, that sort of thing, that's, we don't do it. Um, and then also, we don't do playwriting, screenwriting, and I just, part of why, why I'm telling you what we don't do is partially to explain that we have a real strategy about, we know what we're good at, we dig into it, we've got a long history with it, and we keep going further and further. So um, let me tell you a little bit about some of the, what we do here at lower school. Lower school is a place for experimentation, dabbling, playing, getting your hands dirty, trying out a million things. And we don't, you know, yes, we march towards specialization. Here, we march towards trying a million things out and having an experience. Now, again, going around this strategic idea, we have made the decision not to, to when we have the professional arts teachers, the place where we really, really, really dig in is in music. And let me tell you a little bit about why we've made that decision. Now, I don't expect everybody to absorb everything on these slides, and I will not read everything on the slides, but I want you to understand that music has a special role in brain development. Take orchestra music. When, when playing strings, you have to use fine motor skills on one side. You use gross motor skills on the other. You cross the center line. You do it while reading and listening. And you have to connect those four different parts of how your brain works. And that supercharges your brain. And there are similar studies around percussive instruments, and similar studies around certain kinds of singing instruction. So the, that is one of the reasons why we have dug in around music in the brain. There's just an incredible amount of data that shows that, look, music is another language and it is a way of expressing yourself and it is beauty. But from a purely sort of uh, functional a way of looking at it, it also is a tool to help young minds grow. So, um, again, well, I'll send anybody the slides who want them, but there's a lot of data on this. Um, while we're thinking about uh, our music program and how we do it here and some of the things that make it special, we 
We have incredible music faculty, award-winning doctors of music, people who went to Juilliard, people who've composed for Hollywood, people who grow, it's an incredible music staff. And then on top of that, because what we found is kids take leaps when they are just playing with their unique instrument, we have a cadre of part-time music instructors. It's a huge differentiator for Westminster. Weekly, your students, when they take music, or certain, certain um, of our music programs, will get an instrumental specialist once, sometimes twice a week. So if they're a clarinet player, they're in the band playing clarinet a couple of days a week, and then a couple of days a week, they're just with the clarinets, and just with a clarinet instructor, and that would be true for most of our instruments. So arts integration. It happens all the time, and in ways I'm not gonna call out in every single, every single instance, but I'm gonna call out a few big moments. Um, there, there is drama here at lower school, to be sure, and I, I'm not talking about the data. <laughs> We have drama instruction. We um, look at uh, a few of these projects that some of you, some of you will have heard of: Westward Expansion, the Gods and Goddesses Parade. Over time, teachers have cooked these up. Then they've asked for, "Hey, you know, since we're already acting or we're already writing monologues, can somebody come and help us and help the kids and cook?" And that program, sort of coming from the classroom teachers these moments are getting more and more formalized. And we are, as it happens, sending more and more professionalized drama instruction to supercharge these units. Uh, many of you have heard of Love Stock. It's a songwriting unit that a lot of the kids get into. It's, it's one of the most touching things that happens here at Love. It's a beautiful event. The Christmas pageant, which is a major major event for us, there is the, the, both in the drama that the kids sort of play out through the passion, but also in the rituals of learning stage left and stage right and how to stand, the, the whole piece of it is very much arts instruction from our point of view. As the kids head towards middle school, a couple of things change. Middle school, again, has requirements that kids take arts every single year. Again, I, I, I'm going to keep hammering this. This is an incredible thing. We take arts so seriously. We require it. We offer it year over year. So in middle school, there is an expansion of what is offered. We go, um, we go to, first of all, drama and musical theater become not just offered at the curricular level, we start adding the extracurricular options, and that is a way a lot of our kids enjoy arts. We, um, we have annual arts elective requirements, and then this is the moment, I remember I was talking about the grand arc towards excellence and specialization. Some kids, after being so encouraged here, try this, play with this piece of paper, play with this instrument. As they head towards middle school, the kids start to self-select, and by the way, you guys, by being Love Hall parents and sending your kids from here, it's really an incredible, you guys are getting to play in the pond where the full sweep of the arc really comes into play. Somebody coming in a little later, they may not have had that foundation and experimentation that then leads to a little bit more experimentation and to specialization, so, um, and then, we do continue with this notion of arts integration. MATL, which some of you may have heard about, is this unified semester where there's special projects. Some of those are arts projects. Some of those are performing arts projects. So at upper school, again, this is competitive Westminster. We do have the march towards excellence, and we, we take that seriously. And um, by upper school also, some of the kids in the performing arts, you know, they're, at that point they're choosing to be athletes, they're choosing to be robotics champs, and some of them are, you know, making decisions that are about this notion of what really is my tribe. 
about 35% of our students by the time they're in upper school are what you would call performing arts kids. Four years of band, four years of chorus, that sort of thing. Um, as, as they are you know, heading into their teens, for a lot of our kids, the performing arts, the visual arts, they, it becomes a core part of their self-definition. It's their part of their identity. It's kind of lovely to see where they, they'll, I, you know, in a conversation they'll say, somebody will ask them about themselves, they'll say, I'm a singer, I play, I play percussion in the band. It's just a cool thing. Um, and then we see these opportunities, like we had with Caroline, independent studies. We, the, the upper school equivalent to the targeted semester is called Jan term. So that's another place where we get people doing incredible, Kids will go to California and learn about composition and film. Kids will go to New Orleans and play jazz at Preservation Hall. There's a lot of opportunities that we continue to pepper throughout. So I do want to talk about some important changes on the horizon, and I want to highlight the first one because it's a big change here, and we can certainly talk about it a bit. Strategically, we've made the decision to switch around some of our arts offerings here at lower school. The consequence of that is that band, which has been here for the last 17 years, instead of launching in fifth grade, will now launch in sixth. And uh, a couple of the reasons for that, and it, it, um, we, we will get into in a second, um, one of the things we're Balancing that with is some expanded drama opportunities, again, especially in fifth grade. There's going to be more full-time drama instruction. So as we continue to talk about these changes, I just want to kind of go backwards and, and, and talk a little bit about some of the strategy that underpins them. With young arms, developing faces, developing mouths, um, there's a big moment where you kind of decide who's going to play what instrument in the band. And in fact, instrument companies don't even make some of the band instruments at smaller sizes. Whereas the stringed instruments, you can get junior versions of every single one. And the other thing is the band is a 14 instrument ensemble. So it's a lot of juggling to do. And when one of the things is there's not commonality in the band world about the optimal time to test somebody for what, um, have, what their mouth would, you know, what their mouth has to be grown to a certain place. Their arms have to be long enough to play some of the instruments. And what we were looking at it and there is more on the spectrum, sort of more commonality that a great place to launch band is in sixth grade because people are just a bit more developed for it. The other thing is we have such a huge intake of kids that the integration of creating a full band at that moment, it, was a, it, was, it seemed like a smarter strategic play. Um, and we've identified that drama is a growth area for us. I will, we are now at 9.30, so I'm gonna just completely toggle through some of these. The next big thing that I need for folks to um, picture is we are, we are in Atlanta, we are at a center of media creation both in the recording industry and in the film industry. Westminster is an Atlanta leader and we really need to play ball in terms of arming our students with the language, the skills, and the tools around. And that starts here at Love. We are, we are going to find age appropriate ways to start filmmaking, media creation. And pretty soon, and I, I feel that we are um, on a path to be the only game in town that does that at the level that we're about to roll out. So we're gonna have a, a kind of commitment and investment in your kids' digital storytelling that is, 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 is gonna be a national class. Um, so again, this is what I'm talking, and then, um, your kid might fit in, if you have questions or concerns about any of the changes you see, I'm easy to find and would be happy to spend any time with you. Thanks again. Thank you, everybody.
um, as the parent of three arts kids, I really love that Eric is here and all that he's offering to all of our children. Um, a few quick announcements, I promise, just reminders before we leave. This is our last opportunity to talk through end of year events. Um, we have um, the Westminster Day of Service, which is next Saturday. They still need volunteers, so if you haven't signed up yet, please do. They're particularly looking for volunteers for Chastain Park Conservancy and City of Refuge, if you know those organizations, but lots of opportunities to, to participate in drives as well and just bring supplies. Um, we also have our um, Green Team's Earth Day focused recycling drives. Those are going on right now through the 19th. So um, this was posted on Seesaw, but some reminders about recycling that you can bring in, including technology. Um, we also have our innovation fair coming up April 20th. We still need volunteers for that as well, both parents and children. Um, that announcement has come out in several WPUs and through your room apps. So if you do have time to stop by and help on Saturday the 20th, all of our new pre first students will be joining us, and it's going to be a really fun day. So um, hopefully you all can either come up uh, and visit or volunteer and help us out. The final thing I wanted to remind you guys about is that we have field days and end of year parties coming up in May. Those will need volunteers as well, so continue to look out for emails from your room representatives about how to get involved with your child's um, field day and end of year parties will be on different days all in May. But um, thank you guys. I look forward to seeing you soon. I'm not up here. <laughs> <laughs>